You know, it's funny. I go back to work tomorrow. I'm starting my online class on the 23rd. I'm pretty sure a lot of you already know this. Month four of the pandemic, I've said it time and time and time again. I've been keeping up to date with how long we've been in this COVID-19 era. Normality is coming back slowly but surely. At least for me. At least for me. I'm going back to work. I'm going to start getting a paycheck again. I haven't been spending any money. Normality is slowly coming back for me. And the last impression, the final beat, so to speak, the last thing that is going to be on my mind for this quarantine vacation that I've been on since the end of March, the lasting impression, the final thing that I'm going to have on my mind is backlash. What we saw last night. If you want to talk about a disappointing way to end a quote-unquote vacation, even if it is due to a pandemic, let's watch Backlash. Was this the worst pay-per-view of 2020? I would say no. That accolade belongs to Super Showdown, which took place at the end of February. Goldberg beating The Fiend for the Universal Championship alone. Dubs that the worst pay-per-view of 2020. But Backlash was exactly what I expected. The majority of it was nothing more than disappointment. The matches were not up to par. At least five of them. There was about eight matches on this card. One of them didn't even take place. This was pretty much just a three-match show. I wouldn't say it was the worst pay-per-view of 2020, but it was certainly not a good show. It was certainly not a show that we're going to look back on and we're going to be proud of, except for maybe two or three matches, depending on who you talk to. And based off of what happened here, WWE, they did not give you any faith for what is to come in the summer of 2020, or what is to come throughout the rest of the year. Especially with the news that just broke a couple of days ago with Bruce Pritchard taking over both Raw and SmackDown, which I already ranted on in the Lightning Flash update. You want to go check that out. The link, of course, will be in the description. The Lightning Flash update from June 13th, 2000 and 2020. That link, of course, is in the description. And Backlash, it was pretty much, pretty much a major reason why I'm not going to be talking about Raw and SmackDown come Saturday on the Lightning Flash update this week. I'll be watching. Trust me, I'll be watching. Don't get me wrong. I'll be watching. I'll be tweeting about it. I'm just not going to be taking my normal notes about it like I usually do because I need a week off of reviewing two shit shows. Just one. Just one. I'm not going to be cheesy like everyone else and coin this the greatest rewind ever. Now, the greatest, re the greatest rewind that I've ever done was the rewind for WrestleMania 36. Pure, unadulterated rage and unfiltered facts, if you want to go check that out. I uploaded that, of course, two months ago on this very channel. That was the greatest rewind that I've ever done. But trust me, this is going to be a great rewind, as it usually is. Every video that I do is great. Nobody can touch me. I am the standard bearer of greatness when it comes to wrestling analytics and quality entertainment. Well, there's a reason why I hashtag the best with every single one of my tweets. There's a reason. And you're about to find out why. Please, pull up a chair. I welcome you here today. DJ Storms proudly presents The Rewind. Be my guest. Ladies and gentlemen, of course, if you don't already know who I, who I am, of course I just said it, I'm DJ Storms, the greatest wrestling analyst and the greatest fucking YouTuber on this planet. The best. This, of course, is the Rewind for WWE Backlash 2020, which of course streamed live on the WWE Network last night with the pre-show starting at 6pm Eastern Time. We got a lot to go over. Ultimately, it was a disappointing show, as I expected it, as a lot of people expected it. Not the worst but certainly not good 
by a long shot. Before we get into the matches, please, 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 do me a favor before class starts, before, before homeroom bell rings and Professor Storms starts the class, please go follow me on Twitter at HistoryMakerDJS. Follow me on Instagram and Periscope at the DJ Storms. Add me on Facebook as well for collaborations and business inquiries. Please send me an email. Uh, my email is, of course, StormsTakeOver at gmail.com. Like the official DJ Storms business page, and I may just send you an invite to join the official DJ Storms posse group on Facebook. That is uh, the rundown with Jay Aletto for WWE Backlash. That actually is almost at 200 views, so you guys absolutely killed it there. Lightning Flash update is currently over 140 views, and that's on the road to 25 likes, so I want to thank you guys there. I greatly appreciate it. We're on the road to 2100. We are less than 50 subscribers away from that. I know the progression is slow. But again, I'm a greedy son of a bitch. Let's see if you can get me to 2100, hopefully by the end of the month. I want you guys to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already done so. Obviously, like the video. Try and get this video to 20, 25 likes as per usual. Comment down below. What are your thoughts on Backlash? What was your favorite match? Subscribe. And of course, when you subscribe, you got to hit the notifications bell with a huge coup de grace. That way, you're going to know whenever I pop up on YouTube. Because whenever I pop up on YouTube, it's the best time to be on YouTube. It's the only place you're going to see this Glorious sideburn chin strap combination. Beautiful quarantine mustache. I mean, come on. If you want to if you want to know why I'm the standard bearer of greatness, just look at this right here. I'm a prick, I know. I'm a prick. And I love it. Last but not least, of course, Blue Riot Podcast. Shout out to the Blue Riot. Go follow him on Twitter at Blue Riot with two T's. Go follow the podcast on Twitter at Blue Riot Pod. Him and me, we talk about everything concerning all elite wrestling. Every single Thursday at noon Eastern Time, we talk about AEW Dark, we talk about AEW Dynamite, we're going to be doing that this week, episode 11 of the Blue Riot Storms Review, AEW Dark Might, that's going to be up on Thursday, noon Eastern Time, as always, and it's going to be up on all platforms where you find your podcast, whether that be iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, Anchor, wherever you find it, I want you to go and check it out. It's great. He's great. I'm great, as per usual. I am a narcissistic prick, so if you want to hear me be a narcissistic prick and you want to you want to hear Blue Riot just rant on everything, because he's, he's a complainer just like me. Not as, not as bad as me, but he's also a complainer. We talk about everything AEW Dark and Dynamite related. We got Fighter Fest coming up. Obviously, we're going to be doing a podcast for Fighter Fest as well. I'll be sure to hit him up. I'll be sure to uh, get the details on that. But please, go check out Blue Riot Podcast. The link to the iTunes podcast is in the description. Please go subscribe there and give all the podcasts a listen whenever you get the chance. Let's get straight into the matches. Paulo Cruz versus Andrade for the United States Championship. This was on the pre-show. Shocker. Shocker. This was a Bruce Pritchard initiative, obviously, because everything that Paul Heyman did to build up Apollo Cruz now wasted on the pre-show with Andrade. This is this is a decent match. I'm not saying it was a bad match. It was decent, but ultimately. It was nothing special whatsoever. It's something you're going to go back and rewatch, and it was nothing that we haven't already seen between these two on Monday Night Raw in their past two United States Championship title matches. Matter of fact, matter of fact, when you look back on this, if you were going to have a pre-show match that was only going to go eight minutes, why didn't you just put the Women's Tag Team Championship match on the pre-show? That match didn't even go nine minutes. That match didn't even go nine minutes. That match was actually worse than the United States Championship match. And by the end of it, when you look back on it, the United States Championship match could have kicked off the show. That could have gone 15 minutes as opposed to 8 minutes. And it would have made the show just a little bit better. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. The match wasn't necessarily bad, but it's, again, it's nothing you're going to go back and rewatch. And it was, it was no different than what we've seen in the past two title matches between the two. So Owens came out, and he came out to watch the match. Uh, he was sitting right by Byron Saxton. And Owens is entertaining as shit on commentary. So Cruz, he back body dropped Andrade onto the diamond plate in the beginning portions of the match, then hit a moonsault off the apron. Andrade with the double knees in the corner for a two count on Cruz. Andrade missed the double stomp. And then he got belly to belly, belly to bellied into the corner, a belly to belly throw into the corner. Cruz with a big spine buster for a two. Andrade cut Cruz off on the apron, and delivered a slingshot 
Draping DDT. So it was a combination of Willow's Bell and One Final Beat. The two DDTs that Gargano and Champa do. And it was a slingshot DDT and Cruz got spiked right on his head for a close two count. Cruz with the military press, moonsault, shooting star press combination. And Angel Garza then got involved, distracted the ref. Owen said, fuck this. He hit the stunner. And then Andrade went to take advantage, went for the hammerlock DDT. But Cruz with the toss powerbomb for the win. Now, based off of what happened a few days ago with Bruce Pritchard, brother love, taking over Monday Night Raw and SmackDown now, I was actually under the impression that Andrade was actually going to win back the United States Championship and we were going to have a hot potato title change, but they actually made the right decision here and they had Apollo Crews retain the U.S. title, rightfully so. So now I can only imagine we're going to get Apollo Crews versus Kevin Owens with a legitimate ending as we should have gotten on Monday Night Raw, which I actually can't wait for because Apollo Crews and Kevin Owens in a United States Championship match you give, the, you give those guys 15, 20 minutes, and they're going to tear the house down. I know for a fact they will. As far as Apollo Crews goes, does he make it through the summer with the U.S. title? With Bruce in charge of Raw and SmackDown, I say that's a very slim chance. And that sucks. That sucks because Apollo Crews is someone that you could build a brand around. Apollo Crews is someone that you could put all the effort into to make a world champion. Realistically, like I said, Apollo Crews should realistically be a multi-time U.S. champion, a multi-time intercontinental champion by now. Paul Heyman was behind Apollo Crews' push. And based off of what happened a few days ago, and Vince actually was reportedly, reportedly said to have been blaming the people that Heyman has been pushing. One of those people were Apollo, because of course Vince can't take responsibility for his own shortcomings and failures. So now... Now, more likely than not, Apollo Crews is probably going to lose the title sometime between now and Extreme Rules, and that sucks. If he holds the title past Extreme Rules, I would be legitimately shocked. That sucks. Decent match, nothing special. Apollo Crews retains the United States Championship. We're probably going to get Apollo and Owens sometime between now and Extreme Rules. Should be great, but I have no faith that Apollo Crews is going to retain the United States Championship, and a lot of people don't have any faith that Apollo Crews is going to retain the United States title against Kevin Owens, unfortunately. And again, it sucks. Main show. Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross versus The Iconics versus Sasha Banks and Bailey for the Women's Tag Team Championships in a triple threat match. This match was not as garbage as I thought it was going to be. It was still garbage. Still should have been on the pre-show. And the U.S. title match still should have gotten 15 minutes to kick off the main show. Still garbage, but it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. So, Billy Kay of the I Want to Get My Ears Surgically Removed Conics hit a big boot to Nikki Cross for a two. We had a big knee by Sasha 2K. Nikki Cross ended up breaking up that pinfall. Nikki Cross with a clothesline bulldog combination. And l l let, me just, let me just say this. I love Nikki Cross, but she is lumped into this category. And I have to lump her into this category even though I don't want to. But she is lumped into the category with Alexa Bliss and the Iconics simply because of the fact that her character, her character is a fucking embarrassment. It's an embarrassment. She's, she's a good wrestler. Much better, much better than Bliss and the Iconics. But at the end of the day, she is lumped into this embarrassment category for the women because of her booking. And it pains me to say that. It really, it really does pain me to say that because Nikki Cross was amazing in NXT. Nikki Cross was putting on great matches with Candice LeRae and Bianca Belair. Ruby Riot put on that great last woman standing match with Asuka. And here she is playing second fiddle to a woman who is inferior to her in every sense of the word when it comes to pro wrestling related material. The fact that Sasha and Bailey have to work with these four embarrassments is sinful. And again, it pains me. It breaks my heart to call Nikki Cross an embarrassment because I know how great she can be. But this role that she's been playing, it's terrible. This role that she's been playing is embarrassing. So then Bliss got the hot tag. She came in and she started taking out everyone. And her, her offense is terrible, Alexa Bliss. All she does, all she does is slaps and drop kicks when she gets a hot tag. Really, those, those are like the two most basic moves you could do in between the ropes. I could do slaps and drop kicks. So Peyton Royce 
then targeted Sasha Banks and Nikki Cross. They were out on the apron, and Peyton Royce with a cross body through the ropes, kind of like what Big E does with the spear, but instead it was a cross body through the ropes. It was botched, and she actually nearly killed herself, taking out everyone. But yet people want to tell me that Peyton Royce, they want to tell me that Peyton Royce can wrestle. They want to tell me that the Iconics are actually good at what they do. They want to tell me that the Iconics are entertaining characters. They want to tell me that the Iconics are actual good wrestlers. Meanwhile, Peyton Royce nearly killed herself here. Peyton Royce and Billy Kay at that. They're hazards to themselves, not just their opponents. So then after this, we had Bliss and Cross spiking Peyton with a modified version of the 3D which looked sloppy as shit. Billy Kay and Nikki Cross took out each other on the outside. Bliss went for Twisted Bliss on Peyton. She connected with it, and then Sasha Banks came out of nowhere with a roll-up for the win. Stop the presses! Stop the presses! Breaking news! This is not a drill! Sasha Banks. Sasha Banks just successfully defended a championship on the main roster. No, this is not the apocalypse. You're not living in a dream. No, we're not having a second wave of COVID just yet. Sasha Banks defended a championship successfully on the main roster. And she was the one that got the pinfall win. I'm not lying to you. I know it may be hard to believe, but yeah, Sasha Banks... She got the pinfall win. Sasha Banks successfully defended a title on the main roster. It, we, we, we have to be living in some, in some type of alter, alternate multiverse. Now, at this point, the show was not good. The show was not good, but I was actually pleasantly surprised that we actually got two right decisions back to back in a row. I, I thought for sure that Bliss and Cross were actually going to win back the tag team titles, and we weren't even going to have a chance to have Sasha and Bailey defend those titles in NXT. I could have sworn, I would have bet my life that we were going to see new tag team champions. I predicted Sasha and Bailey, but I did not think that they were going to go forth with it. So, phase one, phase one is completed. Sasha Banks successfully defends a title on the main roster. Now we go into the match on Wednesday with Shotzi and Tegan. I don't even know why they're doing it this early. And to be quite honest, Sasha and Bailey realistically should be waiting a little bit before we actually get this match between Shotzi and Tegan, because Shotzi and Tegan realistically would be the correct team to take the titles off of Sasha Banks and Bailey. But Sasha Banks and Bailey retain the tag team titles. Phase one is complete. Sasha Banks successfully, successfully defends a championship on the main roster. Now, we'll see if we can get to phase two. Sasha Banks has a title reign on the main roster longer than 50 days. Does it happen? I hope so. I hope they have a lengthy tag team title reign going into the fall. I genuinely hope they do. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens there, but this match was garbage. Not as garbage as other people expected, but it was still garbage. Right outcome. Two right outcomes back to back. Show was still not good at this rate. But Sasha Banks and Bailey retain. Rightfully so. We'll see what they can do with Shotzi and Tegan on Wednesday. I actually expect a great match between those two teams come Wednesday on NXT. Jeff Hardy versus Sheamus. And this match actually brought up the show just slightly. This match actually brought up the show to being decent. This actually was the best match of the night for a good chunk of the show. Hardy and Sheamus was the best match of the night. After it was all said and done. Now. This was a great match. Number one. It was physical. It was hard hitting. Not as physical and hard hitting as Drew and Lashley. Which we'll go over. This was a great match. And for the time being. It was labeled as match of the night. In my eyes at least. This was a great match. We had Sheamus using his power against Hardy. In the beginning portions. We had Jeff Hardy with a cross body off the steps. Sheamus then regained control. Big diving knee drop for a two. We had two Irish curse backbreakers for a two. Let me just say something. Sheamus. Sheamus is one of the hardest hitters in the WWE right now. I would not want to be on the receiving end of any of Sheamus' offense. Any of Sheamus' offense could easily drop a guy like me. So Hardy with Whisper in the Wind for a two. Hardy mounted a comeback, modified Sling Blade, and then he went up to the top for a Swanton Bomb, but he was stopped on the top rope. He actually 
fell off the top rope, crashed hard onto Sheamus. Sheamus picked up Hardy into white noise, but Hardy was able to stay alive. Sheamus then locked in the Texas Cloverleaf, but Hardy was able to get to the ropes. We had 10 beats of the Baldrin by Sheamus right to the chest of Jeff Hardy. Again, I would not want to be on the receiving end of any of Sheamus' offense. It looks brutal. It looks like it could cave my fucking chest in. Hardy dodged Sheamus. He went shoulder first into the post. Hardy with the twist of fate. And then he went up to the top for a swanton. He connected with the swanton bomb. But Sheamus got his foot on the rope, I actually thought that Jeff Hardy was going to win it right then and there off the Swanton, but Sheamus got his foot on the rope. Sheamus ended up rolling to the outside. Jeff Hardy followed suit, climbed up on the barricade, walked it like a tightrope, and he jumped at Sheamus off the barricade, but Sheamus caught Hardy with a bro kick off the barricade, looked flush. He threw Jeff Hardy back into the ring, bro kick again, a second one, and Sheamus wins. A great match here between himself and Jeff Hardy on Backlash. Now, for those of you that are whining and complaining, Why didn't Jeff Hardy win? Why didn't Jeff Hardy win? Calm down, fuckers. Calm down. Relax. Breathe in. And then breathe out. And now open your ears. Listen, I went into this thinking Jeff Hardy was going to win as well. Trust me, I'm in the same boat as you. I thought Jeff Hardy was going to win this as well. Sheamus ended up winning this. Now, I look back on it. I look back on it. I was confused at first. I was shocked at first. But I look back at what happened last month in the opening round of the IC title tournament. Jeff Hardy beat Sheamus in the opening round of the IC title tournament. So Jeff Hardy owns a victory over Sheamus. Realistically, if Jeff Hardy won here, the feud would have been over. And Jeff Hardy would have moved on. There would have been no reason for this feud to continue. And if it did continue after Jeff Hardy won, then I would be questioning why it's even continuing. Like, I'm questioning why the feud between Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville is even continuing because Sonya Deville already beat Mandy twice. If Jeff Hardy would have beaten Sheamus twice here, that would have been it. There would have been no reason to continue the feud. Bray Wyatt is more likely than not coming back. Bray Wyatt is coming back after Backlash. It is after Backlash. He'll probably be coming back sometime this month. And he's going to set up a match with Braun Strowman at Extreme Rules. More likely than not, Bray Wyatt, as The Fiend, will win back the Universal title as he should. And Bray Wyatt is going to be Universal Champion going into SummerSlam of 2020. Where does that leave Jeff Hardy? Because if Jeff Hardy were to beat Sheamus, he would have moved on to something else. And you're not going to put him in the Universal title picture. One victory over Sheamus doesn't put Jeff Hardy in the Universal title picture. And on top of that, if Jeff Hardy was to face Braun Strowman, then Jeff Hardy would have to beat Braun Strowman. And you're not going to have Jeff Hardy win the Universal title this early. This is just the start of his journey. What else would Jeff Hardy have done at Extreme Rules? So, Sheamus wins here. Now they're one and one. Extreme Rules is on July 19th. That's Jeff Hardy's playground. Now we're going to get a third match. And we're going to have a match Jeff Hardy style. Extreme Rules match. Jeff Hardy wins. That's the end of the feud. We're going to have the blow off at Extreme Rules in a Jeff Hardy style match. An Extreme Rules match. And Jeff Hardy's going to get the victory over Sheamus. Then he moves on to bigger and better things. I was questioning, again, I was questioning why Sheamus came out victorious. Then I thought back to what happened last month. And then I realized that, again, if Jeff Hardy won, he would have to move on. There would be no reason for them to continue the feud. Now, now that Sheamus has a win, and now they're one and one, now this feud's going to continue into Extreme Rules. We get an Extreme Rules match, and Jeff Hardy's going to win that. Then he can move on to something bigger and better. Possibly a Universal title match, although I think it's still too early. I think it's still too early. Then, then we get Jeff Hardy versus The Fiend, ultimately, at a later date. Jeff Hardy's going to beat The Fiend. Jeff Hardy wins the Universal title. Jeff Hardy achieves his redemption. It only makes sense. It only makes sense. Now, if they don't continue the feud, and this is the end, if they don't continue the feud and we don't get a blow-off match at Extreme Rules in a Jeff Hardy-style match, then they would have fucked up with the outcome. And I will say that they fucked up. 
unless we get a continuation of this feud, and unless we get an Extreme Rules match, a stipulation match of some sort that is Jeff Hardy style at Extreme Rules, unless we get that with Jeff Hardy coming out victorious, then this was ultimately the wrong decision. But I don't mind Sheamus getting the win. I don't mind Sheamus getting the win because it sets up a third match. It sets up an Extreme Rules match, a stipulation match, and Jeff Hardy's ultimately going to win. And then, after Extreme Rules, then the feud's going to be over. Realistically, this is probably the best storyline on SmackDown right now outside of Sasha Banks and Bayley. And they're taking their time with Sasha Banks and Bayley. This, this feud's coming to an end sooner rather than later. Again, if you're not continuing the feud, you fucked up. Now, I, I know I shouldn't be giving him the benefit of the doubt, and I'm not. I'm just going based off of logic. Now, then again, nothing that WWE does is ever logical, or very rarely, what WWE does is logical. We'll see what happens, but I don't mind Sheamus getting the win. It was a great match. These two are one and one We get a third match at Extreme Rules. Jeff Hardy style, Jeff Hardy wins. I can't see this happening any other way. Asuka versus Nia Jax for the Raw Women's Championship. I don't really know what you want me to say about this. Now, Asuka's... Now, Asuka... It just goes to show you how good Asuka is. Because she can lead Nia Jax to a, to a decent match. And yes, she carried Nia Jax through this match. Just go show you how good Asuka really is. So Asuka, she was using her quickness against Nia Jax in the beginning portions of this match. Nia wore down Asuka. Asuka got jackhammered by Nia for a two. We had a big shiny wizard by Asuka for a two. Missile dropkick and a hip attack for a two. Asuka went for a running arm bar, but Nia Carter with a sit out power bomb for a two. Rolling armbar on the outside, and the match ended in a double countout. So Asuka retains the title, and then afterwards, she hit the hip attack off the barricade on Nia, and she walked away with the Raw Women's Championship. Again, Asuka just goes to show you that she is one of the best, that she was able to bring Nia Jax, of all people, to a decent match. But Jesus fucking Christ, when is enough enough? When is enough enough? With the DQ and the countout finishes in championship matches. Not only in championship matches, but on pay-per-view, nonetheless. A pay-per-view is supposed to be your top of the line when it comes to wrestling programs. You're supposed to have blow-offs at pay-per-views. You're supposed to have straight-up matches with straight-up finishes at pay-per-views. In this type of scenario, there is no reason whatsoever why this... This entire feud and this entire storyline should be continuing past Backlash. Asuka should have beaten Nia Jax straight up. That's it. No reason. No reason whatsoever for this match and this feud to end in a double countout. And no reason why the feud should continue. The match itself, it was actually shaping up to be fairly decent. I'm not going to bullshit you. It was actually shaping up to be fairly decent because of what Asuka can do. Asuka... Asuka is actually one of the few people that can actually lead Nia Jax to a decent match. Asuka, Ronda, and Sasha. Those three women have the luxury of being the three women that have been able to carry Nia Jax to a decent match. And Asuka was doing that right here. Just go show you how good Asuka really is. Asuka and Nia Jax. Dare I say it, it was shaping up to be decent. And if it would have ended with Asuka retaining the title straight up, you know what? I would have said it was a decent match. And we had the right decision. Asuka retained. But no, no. You're going to have this, this feud continue into extreme rules. And then you have Charlotte waiting in the wings at SummerSlam after she just pinned Asuka. Because you know, you know that if you got a major pay-per-view, if you got WrestleMania, if you got SummerSlam, you got to have Charlotte Flair. You got to have the tall, blonde Charlotte Flair in a championship match at either SummerSlam or or WrestleMania, and more likely than not, Charlotte could potentially win the Raw Women's Championship, and you're going to shaft Asuka, or we could possibly get a triple threat match between these two. Yet, you have Liv Morgan, you have Ruby Riot, you got Shayna Baszler, you got Bianca Belair, yet Nia Jax, Nia Jax, someone who shouldn't even be in a wrestling ring, period, and you got Charlotte Flair, who shouldn't even be near a championship for the next five years of her career. You got those two in championship matches. Yet you got those four women waiting in the wings for an opportunity. 
yet they haven't been showcased on television in a month, two months, going on three months. The match was shaping up to be fairly decent, and just like that, all of that, all of that washed away with a double count out because you couldn't bear, you couldn't bear to have good old Nia Jax. Someone, someone, someone who's, who, who, who came out in an interview and said, oh, all of these negative fan reactions are getting to me. All the negative fan reactions really go to my head. Well, then how about you improve? How about you spend some time in the PC and actually improve your in-ring skills? How about you stop being so reckless? How about you better yourself so that way we won't have to give you a negative reaction? You are responsible for the negative reactions, Miss Nia Jax. You're responsible for it. Maybe if you weren't so reckless and you didn't injure person after person, maybe if you didn't injure Becky, maybe if you didn't injure Bailey, maybe if you didn't drop Charlotte on her head, maybe if you didn't if you didn't drop Kyrie Sane neck first into the bottom turnbuckle, maybe if you didn't throw Kyrie Sane recklessly into the steps, which caused her to get a cut right here, maybe, maybe if you weren't such a reckless bitch, maybe, maybe we wouldn't have to give you these types of negative reactions. If you want these negative reactions to stop, then improve yourself. Improve yourself, improve your in-ring work, and stop with this poor display of in-ring etiquette. Piss poor. Piss poor, Nia Jax. I don't know what is to come, but you know for a fact that they're going to continue this program. You know for a fact that they're going to continue this feud. You know for a fact that we're going to get Nia Jax and Asuka in some way, shape, or form going into Extreme Rules. I don't know if it's going to be a stipulation match. Based off the double countout, it'll probably be a no disqualification, no countout match. The fact that Charlotte is still on Monday Night Raw, and now Charlotte is waiting in the wings for Asuka after she pinned Asuka, it's even worse. And now I gotta hear that Charlotte is supposedly set for a big push. So winning the NXT Women's Championship at WrestleMania, winning the Royal Rumble this year, those two accolades weren't a push in itself? That wasn't a big enough push! Braun Strowman versus Miz and Morrison. Two-on-one handicap match for the Universal Championship. This was on uh, this this was one of I, I was actually gonna say that this was gonna this was the worst match of the night. I was actually thinking to myself, this was undoubtedly the worst match of the night, and then we got the shitty cinematic fight between the Viking Raiders and the Street Profits, which I got plenty to say on that. I got plenty to say on that. Braun Strowman versus Miz and Morrison. We had Miz and Morrison debut their their new hit single. Hey, 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 ho, 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 Braun Strowman's got to go. This is, okay, this, this is your universal champ. This is a world title program. This is a world title program that is the main focus of a show on a sports-driven network on Fox. World title program on a sports-driven network, and you got two men, one's approaching 40, one's over 40, doing a shitty music video talking about one dude who is six foot eight wetting the bed when he was six years old. That's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm hearing. This was this was worse than the music video that we got at WrestleMania, leading up to their tag team title ladder match. Hey, 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 ho ho ho, Braun Strowman's got to go. Trust me, Braun Strowman needs to go. He needs to go, but not to you two. Not at the expense of you two. Oh, and by the way, by the way, in the middle of the music video, then Braun Strowman's Titan Tron and music hits. They literally added smoke. They added smoke to his entrance, and they literally put train graphics. They put train graphics on the Titantron for his music video. They put train graphics on the Titantron for his music video and it reads Strowman Express. Can you get any more cringeworthy? 
Can you get any more cringeworthy? Yeah, this is this is the universal champion, and you got train graphics. You got train graphics on the Titan Tron for his music video. And you got smoke. As if he's an actual express conductor. This match went about seven and a half minutes. Six and a half minutes too long. You could have given those six and a half minutes to the United States Championship match to kick off the main show. This match should have only gone one minute. This should have gone one minute in and out. You should have given six, six or seven more minutes to the U.S. title match. And you should have put the women's tag team title match on the pre-show. Those, those little changes in itself would have made the show just a little bit better. And maybe I would have been saying that it was a decent show as opposed to a below average show. Miz with a big boot. Morrison with a Fosby flop. Double DDT for a one count on Strowman. Miz got beeled by Strowman. Tagged to Morrison. We had two springboard ends of Gurries and a running knee. Strowman eventually caught Miz with a choke slam. Then he caught John Morrison with a power slam for the win. Match was garbage. Strowman retains as expected. Now, can we finally get to something more important like getting Bray Wyatt back on the show and putting him in a match with Strowman at Extreme Rules and maybe getting the title off of Braun Strowman? I think that would benefit the entire show as a whole if we get the title off Strowman. Please. Por favor. And here's something that really pissed me off right here. And it wasn't it wasn't necessarily the next match because the next match the next match was actually great. Don't get me wrong, the next match was actually great. What pissed me off is that this match was taking place in the mid card. Drew McIntyre versus Bobby Lashley for the WWE Championship. I hate Bobby Lashley. Bobby Lashley is the biggest waste, one of the biggest wastes of a paycheck that we've had in the last two years. Trust me, I understand that. Bobby Lashley is terrible. Bobby Lashley is a waste of space. But this is the WWE Championship of all championships. I don't give a shit what you're hyping up Edge and Orton to be. I don't give a shit if it was Edge and Orton in the greatest wrestling match ever, the greatest street fight ever, the greatest hot dog eating contest ever, the greatest swimming contest ever, the greatest thousand mile dash ever. I don't care if you had Andre the Giant, Randy Savage, Hulk Hogan, Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock. This is the WWE Championship. You're not going to put the Universal title with Braun Strowman, Miz and Morrison, hey, 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 ho, ho, ho. You're not going to put them, you're not going to put them in the main event of Backlash. But you have the hottest guy, you have the hottest guy in the WWE right now. You got the one guy that's been the most consistently good thing about WWE, main roster programming since the Royal Rumble and Drew McIntyre. And he goes into WrestleMania Night 2. He made events WrestleMania Night 2 against Brock Lesnar, of all people. And he beats Brock Lesnar in under five minutes. So Drew McIntyre is good enough to main event WrestleMania Night 2 against Brock Lesnar and beat him in under five minutes. But he can't main event Backlash against Bobby Lashley? Backlash of all shows against Bobby Lashley, of all people? You can't have McIntyre main event backlash against Lashley? I don't give a shit. I really don't. I don't give a shit whatsoever. There is no reason why Edge no matter how good it was, and it was an excellent match, and again, we will talk about it. We'll talk about it and we'll dissect everything, but in no way, shape, or form should a world title match be taking a back seat to anything. This is not Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, WrestleMania 25 or WrestleMania 26. This isn't Edge and Undertaker, Hell in a Cell, 2008. This isn't Money in the Bank. There's a difference between what happened at, at Money in the Bank and what happened here. Money in the Bank is a concept and a show that's headlined by the Money in the Bank ladder match, which took, which took place at Titan Tower. That match may have entered the show, and Drew McIntyre went on second to last. That I understand, because a Money in the Bank match main events a Money in the Bank show. But there was no no concept for Backlash, except for the cheesiest tagline that you could possibly place on Edge and Orton. No matter how good that match was, there's no reason why that match should have main evented over the WWE Championship. Yes, Edge and Orton was the superior match, but this is a world title. 
It pisses me off that world title matches are not main eventing the show. Regardless of that, regardless of the fact that this match didn't main event, this was a great match. Not as great as the match with Rollins at Money in the Bank, but still, this was a great match. This was physical. This was intense. This was hard hitting. And even though the show was even though the show was below average, even though the show was shit, I actually was pleasantly surprised by a lot of things. I was pleasantly surprised that they had Apollo retain. I was pleasantly surprised that they had Bailey and Sasha retain. And I was actually pleasantly surprised here that they allowed these two to go out there and fight. And I did say that if they allowed these two to go out there and fight, then they were going to give you a damn good match. And that's exactly what they did. These two went out there and they beat the shit out of each other for 14 minutes. So Lashley actually locked in the full Nelson before the match even began. So the match ended up beginning. Lashley went right on the attack. Drew McIntyre didn't even have a chance to get his jacket off. Drew McIntyre with a swift or he, uh, he connected with some swift chops on Bobby Lashley. Bobby Lashley with a swift swinging neck breaker. A very swift neck breaker by Lashley. Lashley actually nearly dropped Drew on his head on the floor. This was a scary spot right here where he had Drew McIntyre up in a fireman's carry. And I don't know what happened. I don't know if Lashley slipped. But Drew McIntyre nearly got dropped on his head. It looked brutal. It looked brutal there. Lashley ended up repeating the spot, and he sent Drew McIntyre into the post. Drew McIntyre with a belly-to-belly -belly into the barricade as Lashley was running along the outside. Drew mounted a comeback. We had a big diving clothesline and a spine buster for a two on Bobby Lashley. Bobby Lashley with the pop-up spine buster. He actually popped up Drew pretty high, and he only got a one count. And I like what Drew McIntyre was doing here. One count on Lashley, and he was... Really getting Lashley frustrated. One count by Lashley. Flatliner by Lashley for one again. We had a big reverse Alabama slam by Drew McIntyre. Lashley ended up countering Drew McIntyre and caught McIntyre in a crossface. Drew actually reversed it and Lashley countered into an ankle lock. Drew actually reversed the spear that Lashley went for into a Kimura lock, but Lashley ended up getting to the ropes. Lashley was on the top. Drew McIntyre with a brutal-looking superplex on Bobby Lashley. Drew McIntyre went for the Claymore, but Lashley connected with a spear, a beautiful spear. Drew kicked out. Lana ended up coming out. She said that the ref cheated, obviously getting in the ref's face. Drew McIntyre with the Glasgow kiss, sending Lashley into Lana, taking out her, and then Lana was sent into MVP. Lashley turned around into a Claymore, and Drew McIntyre retains the WWE Championship in a great match, minus that scary spot, and minus the fact that Lana got involved, this was still a great match. Hard-hitting, physical, intense, exactly what it needed to be. Genuinely surprised. It actually turned out a lot better than expected. They put on perhaps the second best match of the night, Drew McIntyre and Bobby Lashley. And this is exactly what I was hoping for. And Drew McIntyre just goes to show you how good Drew McIntyre really is, that he brought Bobby Lashley to a great match. This was Bobby Lashley's best match since Roman Reigns at Extreme Rules of 2018. I would actually go, go, go so far as to say that this was actually better than his match with Roman Reigns at Extreme Rules in 2018. Now, a lot of people are saying, oh, this isn't over. This is going to continue because of what happened with Lana and MVP. Why is, it not, why is it not over? Why is it going to continue? Lana didn't get physically involved. Lana didn't touch Drew McIntyre. Lana didn't touch Bobby Lashley. Lana, uh, MVP didn't touch Drew McIntyre. He didn't get physically involved. Lana got verbally involved. And then Lashley got Glasgow kissed. He got sent into Lana, which took out MVP. And then he got Claymored, pinned one, two, three. Lashley lost. Back of the line. Tom Phillips even said, 13 years of hard work and sacrifice gone up in smoke. So what reason is there for this to continue? It's not going to continue. Drew McIntyre is going to get a new opponent going into Extreme Rules and going into SummerSlam. There's no reason for this storyline to continue. We're going to have a new storyline now. We're going to have the storyline that has taken a back burner for this WWE Championship match between Lashley and, and McIntyre. And we're going to see... We're going to see a breakup storyline between Bobby Lashley 
and his wife, Lana. Or his wife, Lana. That's going to happen. Lashley and Lana, they're done. We're probably going to get MVP managing Bobby Lashley. Where does Bobby Lashley go from here? I say that Bobby Lashley, more likely than not, he's going to split from Lana. He's going to have his partnership with MVP, and we could get a match between Bobby Lashley and Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam. If WWE is able to get Brock Lesnar for SummerSlam, knowing them, they'll probably do whatever it takes. They'll probably throw all the money that they possibly can at Mr. Brock Lesnar to get that match with Bobby Lashley, because outside of this, that's the only other thing that Bobby Lashley could possibly be in that would actually generate some interest. Outside of this great match, I don't think that there's anything else that you could possibly put Bobby Lashley in that's going to genuinely interest anybody outside of a match with Brock Lesnar. So I feel as though Lana and Lashley, they're going to break up. I don't care where Lana goes. Truthfully, I'm surprised they didn't release Lana along with everyone else that they released on Black Wednesday. And as far as Bobby Lashley goes, he's going into a match with Brock Lesnar. Who knows? He could, he could end up winning a match against Brock Lesnar. Who knows? But this itself, this in itself was a great match. Hard hitting and physical. Again, wasn't as good as the match with Rollins and McIntyre at Money in the Bank, but still a great match. No reason why it shouldn't have main evented, considering Drew McIntyre, again, is the best thing about WWE main roster programming since the Royal Rumble. Drew McIntyre, he continues his momentum. I'm very surprised his momentum was not halted. Drew McIntyre, again, puts on a great match. Now, where does he go? I have a feeling I know where he goes. And I'm going to talk about that when we get to Edge versus Randy Orton. But this was one of the best matches of the night. The second match that, realistically, if you wanted to go back and rewatch, you could have. This match and Hardy versus Sheamus, those two matches pretty much made the show watchable, but it didn't make it good. We were supposed to get a Raw Tag Team Championship match between the Street Profits and the Viking Raiders, but then they received word that there was a brawl going back into the parking lot. Strowman's windshield got damaged. Brawl spilled into the PC. They grabbed weapons. They ended up putting the weapons down and they fought like men. We had Ivar rolling a bowling ball into Montez's nuts. Dawkins with a spear to Ivar through the glass door. They take it outside. We had guys with motorcycles showing up. One guy unmasked to be Akira Tozawa. He's speaking in Japanese and he has these ninjas on motorcycles. So the two teams agreed to fight them off together. They fought them off. Tozawa summoned in a monster ninja. Ivar then summoned a fucking turkey leg. As if he's doing the Jedi mind trick from Mallrats with Jay and Silent Bob. So they continue to fight on the production truck after they get away from the, the monster ninja. Dawkins then bulldog Eric into the dumpster. Ivar threw Montez into the dumpster and then Swanton bombed himself onto everyone. Jessica Carr then says their match is next. They find an alligator in the dumpster they were in and the match didn't even take place. I don't even know where to begin as, as if, as if the, the last month of them doing bowling and doing axe throwing and basketball, as if that wasn't enough, then you have to have this. You have this shitty cinematic fight and you don't even have the Raw Tag Team title match take place. Please, can I please ask you a question? Why did you advertise a Raw Tag Team title match if you weren't going to have it take place? Why advertise a match at all on any show if you're not going to have it take place? That concept, that concept of advertising a match only for it not to even, not to even take place, that needs to be abolished immediately. That needs to be abolished immediately. And then, not only do you not have the match take place, but you have this shitty cinematic fight, which resulted in a rip-off brawl straight out of a fucking Jackie Chan movie with ninjas. I didn't ask for a Jackie Chan rerun. I want an actual wrestling show with actual wrestling. And who knows? Same, same, same thing with the United States Championship match. If you would have actually had given these two teams time to actually go out there and do what they do best, and that's wrestle, then maybe it would have made the show just a little bit better. 
The booking, the booking on the WWE main roster programming, I'm telling you right now, it legitimately wants me to smash my head viciously against this table. It legitimately wants, it legitimately makes me want to smash my head viciously against this table. And I'm telling you right now, this, and I'm not even exaggerating when I tell you this, this was worse than the fucking Usi hot bit that they pulled with the Usos and FTR one year ago around this time. I know a lot of people are trying to forget about that, but I don't forget. This, this is worse than that. And then I got, and then, and then, then, then the worst part about it, the worst part about this is I actually have people on Twitter coming into my mentions, my mentions of all, of all mentions. You come into my mentions, you come at me and you're trying to tell me that, oh wow, this is so entertaining. Oh my God, this is so entertaining and funny. We had ninjas on the show. Are you out of your goddamn mind? You out of your goddamn mind? give a shit who you are. If you're telling me that this is entertaining and funny, you're the exact reason why the tag team division and the Raw Tag Team Championships are in this embarrassing state. I don't have, and yet, yet, yet people wonder why I don't respect anyone. People wonder. People wonder why I am the way that I am. People wonder why I don't respect anyone. I don't care who you are. If you enjoyed it, good for you. What do you want, a sugar cookie? You want a fucking sugar cookie? You want a brownie? You want an M&M brownie? I enjoyed it! Great! You want a piece of banana cream pie? I don't care if you enjoy it! I didn't! Just because you enjoyed it, doesn't mean it's good! This is doing a lot more damage than it is entertainment for the overall grand scheme of things. In the overall grand scheme of things, this is doing more harm than you could ever imagine. So much so that I don't even want to see an actual tag team title match between these two teams. More likely than not, we'll probably get that tonight on Monday Night Raw. I don't even want to see an actual tag team title match. I don't. And I'm fucking sweating. What time is it? I need to get some, I swear to you. I, I, when, I, when, I, when I get out of here, I'm getting some lunch. All the more reason, this, this type of shit, all the more reason why I am not even talking about Raw or SmackDown on the Lightning Flash update this Saturday. This, this is one of the last impressions that I get on this quarantine vacation that I've been on since March before I go back to work tomorrow. This is going to be on my mind when I'm cutting fruit. This is going to be on my mind when I'm stocking out groceries. This is going to be on my mind for the entirety of my shift. And then, and then, you know, I actually had some people tweeting me, is it Wednesday yet? Brace yourselves. You know, you're not going to be, you're not going to be asking if it's Wednesday unless it's for all elite wrestling. Because I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you right now, it is only a matter of time before Bruce Pritchard takes over NXT. With the reports of Vince not being happy with NXT, it is only a matter of time before we start seeing shit like this. This. On NXT. WWE had the opportunity. He had the opportunity to do the right thing. Put these two guys out there for 15 minutes. And you could have given us a great tag team title match. Which could have brought the show up just a little bit. This is what Vince McMahon thinks of tag team wrestling. Jackie Chan ripoffs, alligators and dumpsters, throwing bowling balls at people's nuts. Anything you can do, we can do better. High school drama. High school drama between, between four 30-year-olds. Again, I will state. If you are going to tell me that this was entertaining and this was enjoyable, you're the fucking problem. You are the fucking problem. I don't care who you are and I don't care how many times I will explain it over and over again. There's a difference between an opinion and there's a difference between you just being an idiot. If you're telling me that you enjoyed this, if you're telling me that this was good, you're just a fucking idiot. You're just an idiot. There's a reason why I don't have any respect for anyone. 
Because people, people have lowered their standards to a point where they just accept trash on a silver platter. They consume it and they eat it and they, and they act as if it's a five-star meal. That's pretty much what you're doing. WWE is giving you trash. You are lowering your standards and accepting this trash and saying, wow, this is great. Acting as if it's the greatest thing that you've ever had. This is not good. This is not good whatsoever. Oh, lighten up. If I wanted some comedy bullshit, I would go and I would watch Comedy Central. I would watch Jeff Dunham. I would watch Gabriel Iglesias, the fluffy guy. I would not watch this. I don't watch this for comedy. If I want comedy, I look towards Otis. If I want comedy, I look towards our truth This, this is them overplaying comedy and this is them overplaying it to the max overexposing it, shoving it in everyone's face, and expecting everyone to go along with it. This was not funny. This was not entertaining. This was not enjoyable whatsoever. If you're telling me it was enjoyable, good for you. God bless you. I don't give a shit. Newsflash. Your opinion sucks. Word of advice. Don't share it with me. Don't share it with me. When I'm doing what I'm doing on Twitter and I am writing down my notes, when I'm taking all of these notes right here, when I'm taking all of these notes, when I'm taking these notes and I'm tweeting away and I'm not bothering anyone and I'm not going into anyone else's mentions unless, unless, unless you are going to come at me with an intelligent stance, don't tweet me. If you don't like the truth that I'm speaking, do not tweet me. Do you get the picture? You bastards. I swear, I'm telling you, I, by, the, by the time I'm 25, my entire sideburn chin strap combo and this new mustache, I've only had this mustache for about three months now. I'm telling you right now, my hair is going to be gray. By the time I'm 25, the more that I keep on, the more that I keep watching this, the more that I keep talking about this, it, and it, it, it brings me success. Don't get me wrong. It brings me success. But if I keep doing this, I'm telling you, I'm going to be gray. I'm going to be gray by the time I'm going to be bald by the time I'm 25. My hair is going to be falling out in the shower. I keep on doing this shit. Jesus. Edge. Versus Orton. By the way, I don't know if you guys knew, but this this had the potential to be the greatest wrestling match ever. Right? Now, I went into this thinking that this was going to be a complete disappointment. They had Howard Finkel voice-overing, announcing, they had the voiceover of Howard Finkel announcing the two competitors to the greatest show, th by the way, the greatest show, the greatest show theme song, I'm telling you right now, it is one of the most annoying songs that I think I have ever heard, so much so that I'm going to have nightmares about that song, I'm going to have nightmares with that song playing in the background. I'm going, I'm literally, I'm literally going to be running down a dark alleyway with the greatest show playing in the background in my dreams. You couldn't have picked, a, you could not have picked a worse song. So much so, I actually prefer, I prefer Blinding Lights from The Weeknd over The Greatest Show. They had The Greatest Show in the background and the voiceover of Howard Finkel. They had all these fancy lights, these piped in crowd reactions it just felt so, so like it just felt so manufactured if it, it felt so manufactured and right out of the gate i'm thinking this is cringy right out of the gate i'm thinking i'm thinking this is nauseating right out of the gate right out of the gate now the match started started out very technical edge he got tripped up by orton and Orton was actually toying with Edge. And I was trying to pretty much cut out all these piped-in crowd reactions and the fancy lights and all these awkward camera angles. I was trying to cut all that out. And after a while, I was able to. 
So Orton was toying with Edge, and I, I actually liked what Orton was doing there. And Orton, when you take a look at Orton, he knows, he knows he's good. He knows he's good, and he knows, he knows he can toy with someone. And, he, and the facial expressions that Randy Orton has, it's something like that that you don't really see very often. And that's why I love Randy Orton. So Edge, he channeled his technical wrestling skills, dropped down, leapfrog on Orton, couple arm drags with a hammerlock. Edge actually busted Orton open right around his right eye. Like his right eye had an entire blood barrier around it. And I believe I believe the cut was right above his brow, if I'm not mistaken. So then the crowd, or the piped-in crowd reaction, started chanting, This is awesome, which was even more cringeworthy. Edge locked in a cross face, very technical, but Orton got to the ropes. Orton then threw Edge into the barricade, into the post, into the stairs, into the plexiglass, and then back suplexed him onto the announce desk. That was actually a nice flurry by Orton. Orton then tried for the Three Amigos, but Edge reversed it into his own Three Amigos. Orton, he stopped Edge on the top and delivered a huge superplex. We had a big double cross by the by both men. Both men are down. Edge reversed the draping DDT from the top into an execution for a two. Big sliding elbow for a two by Edge and a cross body off the top rope. Beautiful cross body by Edge for a two. We had Orton with the Olympic slam, the angle slam for a two. Orton hit the draping DDT and then Orton, Orton, he went for the RKO. Edge reversed it. Orton, he went for another RKO after he did a leapfrog over Edge, but Edge countered with the Edge-O-Matic. Edge-O-Matic for a two. Edge went for the spear, but Orton dodged it. But then, Orton went for the RKO again, but Edge caught him with a kill switch. They were breaking out all the stops here. So we had Olympic slams, we had the three amigos, cross bodies, executions. Then Orton, Orton, he regained control and he hooked the arms, looked directly into the camera, and did a pedigree in tribute to Triple H. Side note, Orton actually delivers a pretty decent pedigree. Or, you know, Orton, you know, I was actually, I was actually, you know, we were talking with Jay Aleto. I was talking with Jay Aleto. For those of you who didn't watch the rundown for Backlash with Jay Aleto, me and Jay Aleto were talking, and we were talking about how, how Orton, I believe we were talking about how Orton, he kind of mocks, kind of mocks everyone for doing all of these fancy moves like Tope Con Heroes and stuff like that. Oh, no, 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 sorry, it wasn't Jay Aleto. I was actually in a Skype session. I was in a Skype session with Nathan Best, my friend from the UK. Shout out to him, I think he's watching. It wasn't Jay Aleto, I'm sorry, it was, it was Nathan Best from the UK. We had a Skype session yesterday a few hours before Backlash, and we were talking about Randy Orton mocking all of these independent guys for doing all these crazy moves. And we see Orton breaking out all of these different moves. And I'm I'm telling I'm talking to Nathan, and he knows what I'm what I'm talking about if he's watching this. And we were talking about how Orton mocks everyone for doing these moves, but in reality, Orton could probably do all these moves. Orton, he delivered a Styles Clash to AJ Styles a few months ago. It was a pretty decent Styles Clash. Orton delivers a pretty decent pedigree here. Orton, more likely more likely than not, can do all these Tope Con heroes and moonsaults. He just chooses not to do them because he's preserving himself. So Randy Orton himself, I, I think Randy Orton can do it all. Randy Orton himself, he can do it all. He delivers a pretty decent pedigree. I think he could do a lot more if he wanted to. He just chooses not to. Edge was able to kick out of the pedigree. And Orton was shocked. He was arguing with the ref. Orton went for a Irish whip. Edge countered and delivered a rock bottom to Randy Orton. But Orton kicked out. Edge kept rolling up Orton before eventually getting hit with the RKO. But Edge kicked out again. Orton went for the punt, but Edge hit the spear. And then Edge pulling his hair back. He had the crazy eyes going. 
went into the corner and delivered a second spear, but Orton kicked out of two spears back to back. Orton hit a second RKO, but Edge kicked out again. Orton now arguing with the ref, similar to how John Cena was arguing with the ref when Kevin Owens kept on kicking out of the attitude adjustment. Orton arguing with the ref. He kept on arguing with the ref. He was telling him, no, 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 that was three. You got to be kidding me. Edge regained control, got the head and arm triangle choke. That was the anti-venom that Christian coined it. But Orton hit a low blow. He looked like he went low on Edge. It looked like he went low on Edge. The ref did not see it. Orton then broke out the punt. Yes, the patented skull-rattling punt to the side of the head, and Orton wins. Was this the greatest wrestling match ever? Absolutely fucking not. Was it main event worthy? Yes, but at the same point in time, still no. Should it have main evented? No. The WWE Championship should have main evented. The piped in crowd reactions and the greatest wrestling match ever tagline, jack shit. Absolute jack shit. Completely forced, completely overhyped, completely overproduced, but, but, the overall match itself, I thought it was excellent. The overall match itself was excellent. Both men poured everything into that match. Edge at 46, Edge at 46, put on this type of matchup for 40 minutes. And whether he tore his bicep or not, which reportedly he did, and it sucks that he did, but Edge, Edge at 46, put on this type of match. While it will not go down as the greatest wrestling match ever, it will definitely go down as one of the best matches of the year. I thought that this was an excellent match from start to finish, and Orton and Edge poured out all the stops to make this a great wrestling match. They definitely succeeded in that regard, and what they did in between those ropes, whether you hate the tagline or not, whether you hate the piped-in crowd reactions or not, you would be an idiot. If you were to discredit what these two men did, these two men poured out everything in this match. This match, excellent. This match was excellent. Should it have main evented? No. Was it the greatest wrestling match ever? Absolutely fucking not. But by the end of it, by the end of it, people are going to look back on Backlash and say that Edge and Orton was a great professional wrestling match in itself. It was definitely one of the best matches of the year. And Edge at 46, Edge at 46 should definitely be proud of what he did. And it just goes to show you why these two are two of the best. Even at 40 for Randy Orton and 46 for Edge. These two, excellent stuff. And you know something? I thought that Edge was going to win. I really thought that Edge was going to win. He didn't win. But ultimately, I can't complain about the outcome. I can't complain about the outcome because ultimately... We got an excellent professional wrestling match. I can complain about the tagline, yes. I can complain about the fact that the WWE title didn't main event over this. I can definitely complain about the fact that the piped-in crowd reactions were cringy as shit and the presentation was awful, but I can't complain about the overall wrestling match because what was done in between those ropes was exceptional. And if anyone's going to complain about what was done in between the ropes, I mean, you're just a flat-out idiot. You, you can't. You cannot complain about what happened in between the ropes. And you can't complain about the outcome either. And I'll tell you why. Now, Edge, he tore his bicep. More likely than not, they were building towards a third match at SummerSlam. The plans were actually rushed. This match was actually supposed to take place at SummerSlam, but obviously, you know, with Vince McMahon thinking that the younger talent can't draw, so you rely on these legends... You rely on these legends to actually draw for the shows and the pay-per-view. And we ended up getting the match at Backlash. More likely than not, we were probably going to build towards a rubber match at, bat at a SummerSlam. And Edge was going to win that. Edge tore his bicep. He's going to be out for four to eight months, unfortunately. Orton won. What happens here? Well, afterwards, first things first, Orton said, go home and tell Beth and your two girls that Uncle Randy said hi. And I absolutely love that line. Orton is one sadistic, cold-hearted bastard. And that's one thing that Randy Orton is always going to play exceptionally well. Randy Orton as a heel just 
getting down on edge, getting down on his hands and knees, getting nice and close to edge and telling him, I told you so. Just go home. Tell your wife and kids Uncle Randy said hi. I mean, how can you not love Randy Orton after that? How can you not love Orton after that? The match itself was excellent, and after a match like that, Orton won. I thought Edge was going to win, but looking back on it, similar to the Jeff hardy Sheamus incident, I actually don't mind Orton coming out victorious. And the reason why is because of the simple fact that Drew McIntyre, he has no challengers. The match with Lashley, great match, but ultimately Lashley lost clean, back of the line. Tom Phillips even said, 14 years worth of sacrifice for Bobby Lashley, up in smoke. All the hard work that MVP did, up in smoke. He's done. Lashley is done. Lashley is going into a match with Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam. That's it. What happens with Drew McIntyre now? Drew McIntyre does not have any heels right now. Drew McIntyre. Now that Orton just beat Edge, and Edge, he's going to be out with a torn bicep. He's going to have to rehab towards the end of the year. Edge will probably come back, and he could probably pick up the feud with Randy Orton. Maybe he, maybe he might come back a little sooner. Hopefully, hopefully, the injury is not as serious as we thought. The Achilles tendon injury, Edge got that in July. We thought he was going to be out a year. He came back in six months. We thought that Edge was going to be out four to eight months here. He could, for all we know, Edge could come back in two months. Edge could come back in two months. Who knows? Who knows? Edge could possibly come back in two months here against Randy Orton, and he could po possibly pick up the feud against Randy Orton. Who knows? We'll find out. We'll find out, but... Ultimately, ultimately, Edge is gone for now. Edge is written off of television, whether it be through kayfabe or whether it be through an actual injury. Now, Randy Orton just beat Edge. Randy Orton beat Edge in an excellent match to main event backlash. You know what you can do? You can have Orton come out and get in the face of Drew McIntyre. Because Orton, he can get in the face of Drew McIntyre and say, Hey, I main evented backlash and I beat Edge. I main evented Backlash over you, and I beat Edge. Now, now you have the opportunity to put Randy Orton against Drew McIntyre, and now Randy Orton and Drew McIntyre can go into a program going into Extreme Rules. What happens with Drew McIntyre at SummerSlam? I don't know. And if anything, I actually called Aleister Black to be the one to take the title off of Drew McIntyre at SummerSlam, but with what's going on right now, I think that may be too early. Could we potentially see Aleister Black versus Drew McIntyre at SummerSlam? Yes. And to be quite honest, if I was them, I would do that. If I was them, I would do that. Because then you can have Drew McIntyre beat Aleister Black. And you can have Aleister Black go on a redemption storyline into the Rumble. You can have him win the Royal Rumble and get a rematch with Drew McIntyre at next year's WrestleMania. That would be great storytelling right there. Either way, you can't just leave Aleister Black unrewarded. Aleister Black has been winning and winning and winning like I've been saying, and he's received nothing in return. Aleister Black needs, he needs a payoff, whether that, whether that may result in a loss or not. But if it is to result in a loss, you can turn that into a storyline. Black versus Drew McIntyre in the main event of SummerSlam. I don't know about you, but I would say that that's a pretty damn good match in its own right. Drew McIntyre could beat Aleister Black. Black finally gets a payoff. He finally gets a WWE Championship match. Then, Aleister Black, he could go into the Royal Rumble next year, and he could win the Rumble, and he could beat Drew McIntyre at next year's WrestleMania with a black mess. But as far as right now goes, Drew McIntyre doesn't have any challengers. Drew McIntyre doesn't have any heels. Drew McIntyre, again, he has been the most consistently good thing about WWE since the Royal Rumble, main roster-wise specifically. Beat Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania. He won the WWE Championship. Great match with Seth Rollins and Money in the Bank. Great match with Bobby Lashley at Backlash. Now, you have to continue that momentum. So now, Randy Orton is beaten Edge. Now you put Randy Orton against Drew McIntyre for the WWE Championship at Extreme Rules in the main event, and you continue that hot streak for Drew McIntyre, and you have Drew McIntyre versus Randy Orton in a great match for the WWE Championship at Extreme Rules. The story writes itself. Now, could you have Edge come out and cost Randy Orton? Possibly, but I don't think that's going to happen considering that a lot of sources, PW Insider, Dave Meltzer, and Fightful came out all, and they said that Edge is injured. So Edge, 
He's probably not going to be seen until after SummerSlam. Hopefully, I'm hoping that the recovery is speedy. I'm hoping that the recovery is quick. I hope the recovery is easy. But ultimately, but ultimately now, now you have the opportunity to pit Drew McIntyre against Randy Orton. It's going to be a great match. going to be a great feud. There's no one else. The dots, the dots only line up towards Drew McIntyre and Randy Orton at Extreme Rules. There's no one else. And then, Drew McIntyre versus Aleister Black, that's the only match that you could possibly do at SummerSlam, because Aleister Black has the most momentum. You're probably going to get Rey Mysterio versus Seth Rollins at SummerSlam. You're going to get Bobby Lashley versus Brock Lesnar. You're probably going to get Edge versus Orton if Edge is healthy by that time. He needs surgery. He needs surgery, and more likely than not, he probably already got it. More likely than not, Edge probably already got the surgery, considering that they filmed the match about a week or two ago. What's done is done. But the match itself, great match, excellent match, beautiful story told within the ring. Should it have main evented over the WWE Championship? No. No matter whether this match was the best match of the night, which it was, no matter, no matter, world title matches always main event the show. Randy Orton... He's going to face off against Drew McIntyre at Extreme Rules. There's no one else. I can't see anyone else getting the shot at Drew McIntyre outside of Randy Orton. And Drew McIntyre, he's going to continue his momentum. Drew McIntyre is going to have a great match with Randy Orton at Extreme Rules. Ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up this edition of The Rewind as this notepad... Is finished. That notepad is finished, and I got a new notepad, and I'll be starting this notepad. I'll be starting this new notepad tomorrow for AEW Dark, because I will not be taking notes on Raw tonight or SmackDown on Friday. I will be talking about it. Trust me, I'll be tweeting about it. You'll be able to hear my thoughts. You'll be able to hear everything going on between um, Monday Night Raw and SmackDown with me on Twitter, but I will not be talking about it on the Lightning Flash update. Just for this week, I need a break. The momentum will not be stifled for the DJ Storms brand, don't worry. I got plenty of content coming. Lightning Flash update is coming on Saturday. I got plenty more collaborations coming. Please check out all the links in the description. Like, comment, and subscribe. Do it all. Do it all. Support the brand. Support your boy. I am planning on getting a new shipment of DJ Storm's wristbands, so if you're interested in a wristband, please hit me up. I'm going to try and get a new shipment probably by the end of the month. If I do not, that's probably because I am busy, obviously, with me going back to work tomorrow, as I've stated numerous amounts of times, and my online class starting on the 23rd. I will keep you guys updated on everything. I'll keep you guys updated on future collaborations between me and a lot of other individuals that I have my eyes set on. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm DJ Storms. This has been the rundown, or not the rundown, the rewind, excuse me. See, th th this, is, this is me all out of whack because I've been ranting and ranting and ranting on the majority of things. But ultimately, Backlash, not a good show whatsoever. Definitely not the worst pay-per-view. Nothing more than a three-match show. Nothing you're going to go back and rewatch. I can only hope that Extreme Rules is going to be better. Although, I doubt it because when has this company ever given us something of substance on a consistent basis. I'm DJ Storms. This has been The Rewind. You guys have a great night. I will see you guys for Raw tonight. If you if you don't want to watch, I'm not going to blame you. If you don't want to tune in, I won't blame you. But I'll be tweeting if you want to uh, join in on it. Don't piss me off, though. I'll see you tonight.